Uh, good evening, Dr. Well. Hope everything's going okay. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the fraud surrounding Oshwin, and let's get started with a little bit of background information. Uh, so Oshwin started, it was uh, founded and run by William Irby in 1988. Uh, the company prior to the 2008 financial collapse specialized mostly in uh, subprime mortgage loans. Uh, post the 2008 financial collapse, uh, the company started becoming big because they would buy back foreclosed homes uh, that foreclosed as a result of the 2008 financial crisis. Um, so they achieved significant growth between 2011 and 2014 uh, because of this. And because of this, they also had to start two, uh, two spin-off companies. So both of these companies were independently owned and, uh, and uh, publicly traded on the market. Uh, also, both of these companies were run by William Irby, who is the same uh, founder of Oshwin. Um, the first one is Altasource. Altasource specialized in purchasing foreclosed homes from Oshwin whenever uh, the subprime uh, subprime loans that Oshwin gave away to borrowers uh, defaulted. Um, this way, Oshwin didn't have to uh, spend a significant amount of resources uh, dealing with all of the regulatory actions that needed to happen after a home is foreclosed, such as you know inspection costs, boarding up the home, and reselling it on the market. Uh, Altasource did all of that for Oshwin by purchasing uh, the homes from Oshwin. Uh, the second, the se second spinoff that Oshwin started was Home Loan Servicing Solutions. Uh, this company would purchase the rights to mortgage servicing rights. Uh, for a flat fee from Oshwin. Uh, this would give them uh, access to all of the future principal and interest payments that Oshwin would have received from its borrowers that it sold subprime mortgage loans to. Um, this way, Oshwin was able to be so-called capital light. So this way, they wouldn't have to buy more debt or sell equity to be able to raise funds uh, to purchase more or to, to loan more uh, subprime mortgages to other borrowers. Um, so since all of these companies were run by William Irby, there's a pretty uh, pretty significant conflict of interest between uh, between the companies, uh, especially since all of them were publicly traded. So one of the things that the company tried to do is they uh, the companies tried to uh, keep William Irby away from any negotiations between all of the companies. However, um, there tended to be a, a pretty significant amount of internal control issues with this. Specifically, William Irby would talk to many of the key uh, executives that were in charge of negotiations between the companies outside of the negotiations, and William Irby uh, signed off on all the transactions between the companies. Um, the reason this is a problem is because Oshwin ended up being the biggest company out of the three. And it was also the company that William Irby had the most uh, shares of stock in. So William Irby attempted to push some of the bad business from Oshwin to Altasource and HLSS, uh, and therefore would help Oshwin uh, increase its financial position. But this was detrimental to the shareholders of Altasource and HLSS. Um, additionally, Oshwin lost a lot of paperwork regarding each of the transactions that happened between these companies. Um, they said it was just an accident, but you know, I, I kind of tend to think that it probably wasn't. Um, and, and you know, I was looking through all the financial statements uh, regarding this too, and um, they were pretty they were pretty lax on the description of the internal controls that they had about this issue. Uh, they, they said stuff like, William Irby wasn't allowed to partake in significant transactions between the company, but they didn't talk about what significant tr transactions were, what that meant. They didn't have any detailed descriptions on what the internal controls were, um, and therefore they, they, that was one of the biggest problems with the company. Um, the second fraud that they were indicted with was uh, a problem with misvaluing their MSRs. So whenever Oshwin sold its rights to the MSRs, to uh, HLSS. This is a journal entry that they would have recorded. So Oshman would have debited cash and credited a financial liability, which is kind of like a notes payable. 
HLSS would in turn debit a notes receivable under a name of rights to MSR and credit cash, right? So remember, HLSS is giving Oshwin a pretty flat fee of cash so that Oshwin could use that cash to purchase more or to distribute more subprime mortgages to borrowers. Where this became a problem is that this is a transaction that doesn't happen very often in the market. So MSRs are considered a level three asset, which means that there's no real backing to how much they should be valued. So in order to value it, HLSS would have to hire a third party to value it at fair value for them, and HLSS would do that as well. So they would come up with some kind of quantity or valuation for it at the beginning of the transaction, and then they would revalue it every quarter. And so to do this, HLSS and the third party both valued it in a different way. HLSS would only revalue the asset every quarter if the amount of impairment it received changed by more than 5%. So if the asset stayed kind of the same but decreased by a little bit, they just wouldn't change it. Oshwin would also treat its note payable amount the same way as the MSR, and they would use HLSS valuation for their books as well. The problem with this is that the MSRs are worth billions of dollars, and so just a 5% difference is a pretty significant monetary difference. So having a 5% threshold was considered too much for the SEC, and so they were dinged for that as well. You can see here that this also constituted a pretty significant portion of Oshwin and HLSS's assets. So the MSRs represented about 26% of the total assets of the company in 2013, which is when the fraud actually occurred. And you can also see there is a huge jump between 2012 and 2013. And for a company that typically doesn't deal with mortgage servicing rights, this was kind of a big red flag for the auditors that were in charge of this. Financing liabilities were the same thing. They had a huge four times increase, even though the company didn't grow that much in between the two years. So it was just kind of a red flag for the auditors, and that's part of the reason why they got caught. So I'll talk a little bit about William Irby. This is the guy who is mostly in charge of both types of the fraud. Irby is kind of a reclusive man, especially after the fraud occurred. He kind of fell off the market, took everything off his Facebook, took everything off his LinkedIn. So not a lot of people know much about him. He started kind of small, went to a small liberal arts college for his undergraduate, and then he went to Harvard to get his MBA. Started at General Electric and started Oshwin in 1988. And since then, he was their executive chairman until 2014 when the company was indicted for this fraud amongst other problems, which we'll talk about in a second. A lot of his friends said that he was a frugal man, but I tend to think that that's not really true. In 2002, he moved to this luxurious mansion. It was about $4 million in Atlanta. And, you know, I mean, he and his wife lived pretty lavishly. He didn't have any kids, so he saved up a lot of his money and just spent it on his wife. After the company decided that he wasn't fit to run their business anymore, he moved to the Virgin Islands in 2014 and recently has just bought a Maltese passport, which I thought was kind of interesting. So you can do that for – you can buy a Maltese passport for $600,000, which grants William Irby citizenship to the United – to the European Union without actually having to go through any of the European Union citizenship laws. So who knows what he's going to be doing afterwards. I don't know if he's planning on moving his business up there. He's now running another small subprime mortgage loan 
uh, company in the Virgin Islands, and he might move it to Europe where they don't know much about him, but um, but we'll see. Um, so we'll talk about the fraud triangle. Um, the opportunity for William Irby to commit this fraud uh, came in the wake of the 2008 industrial collapse. Uh, that's when Oshwin started becoming really big. Um, the company was built on a lot of malpractice. So outside of the, the fraud that we actually talked about and that the SEC found out about them, um, William Irby and Oshwin were, uh, were accused of maliciously, uh, maliciously taking money away from the people who uh, they sold loans to. So since this is a subprime mortgage lending industry, typically what would happen is Oshwin would sell loans to people who didn't have very good credit so that they could purchase homes that were way over their budget. Um, and they would do this knowingly. And generally they would kind of coax them into it. And then once their homes foreclosed, they didn't give them any help at all. Um, so in 2014, uh, at the same time as the, uh, as the actual fraud that they were committed to, um, Oshwin had to pay out a class action lawsuit uh, from over, I, I think, something like 100 or 120 different uh, homeowners that lost their homes because of um, the, the malicious acts of Oshwin. And, um, and so, you know, it's one of those interesting things where prior to the 2008 in industrial collapse, you know, we, we saw a lot of people or a lot of the big banks were – uh, taking advantage of the, the subprime market and overvaluing um, the loans that they were giving out. And clearly this was a, a pretty bad thing to do. Um, but right after the economy collapsed, Oshman went and did it again. Uh, so they usually have a pretty bad taste in people's mouths. The company still runs. Um, but this is how Oshman started off. Um, his pressure was rapid and unsustainable growth. So again, uh, starting in 2011, Oshwin started growing exponentially. So it, it became imperative for the company to start a couple of spin-off companies uh, so that it could take the pressure off Oshwin itself. Uh, this led to you know, the opportunity for William Irby to uh, commit some related party transaction fraud. Um, and I, I figure he probably felt like he needed to to keep the company afloat. Um, rationalization, I mean, Irby's just kind of a bad guy. Um, just just knowing the, the subprime market uh, itself and, and the type of business that he did to become as wealthy as he did, it seems pretty, you know, pretty obvious that he wouldn't really mind committing a, a fairly low fraud. Uh, or, yeah, it, it wasn't that big of a fraud compared to the type of business that the company was interacting in. Um, so my final thoughts, um, I don't think the fraud itself that we covered in this class uh, was nearly as important as the class action lawsuit that Oshwin was uh, indicted for. Um, I think the company itself profited from pretty malicious acts, and I think that's what caused Oshwin to really tank in the end. Um, but... I, I think that the, the fraud itself, especially the, the misvaluing of the level three assets, was a pretty smart idea. I think if I was going to commit fraud with a company like this, I think this is probably how I would do it. Um, this is how companies prior to the 2008 financial collapse built their market on, is that they would misvalue uh, the subprime bonds that they were selling on the market. And it's kind of similar to the way Austin was uh, operating. They just didn't do it nearly as effectively as those companies. Um, so, you know, I, I thought it was an interesting case. Uh, I think William Irby is a pretty bad guy. Um, but, yeah, this is, uh, this is awesome. So thank you for uh, having me in your class, and I hope you have a great rest of the semester.